the north. East to the south and to the west. The smoke from the sage is going to take our prayers today, call in all our good spirits and good thoughts, and take away all our bad spirits and bad thoughts. And I want to ask the sky people, the great spirit, Mother Earth. To all these plants, the oak, the willow, willow to build our houses, oak to give us acorns to feed us, to all the plants and animals, to the swordfish, the chief of all the fish, to the eagle, the chief of all the birds, to bear, the chief of all the animals, the four-legged animals, and to lizard and horned toad, the chief of the small creatures. We pray today for our leaders, local, county, state, national, our college leaders, and our future leaders, we pray for them. To our warriors and soldiers, we pray for them and send our prayers and hope that they get home safely to their families. To our elders, we pray for our elders, that they make it through these difficult times. And as they get towards the end of the journey that they pass their lessons on, to the young people. To, we pray for the young people that they take those lessons from their elders and share them with their children and the next generation and next generation. We pray for those that are not here that have gone to the spirit world, that they made it safely and that they're looking down on us guiding us today. And I pray for all the students and teachers today that you learn and teach with an open heart and open mind in love and tenderness I leave this offering of tobacco and thank Mother Earth for everything that she gives us. So thank you for allowing me to do this opening blessing and to acknowledge the first peoples that have been here for over 13,000 years. Have a blessed day, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Now I'd like to introduce Professor Tanya de Clark. Tanya is Camilla de Clark, immigrated from the from El Salvador to the United States to flee the Salvadorian Civil War during the 1980s. Her family journey to migrate. Her family journey to migrate to the United States was a legal, social, and political battle. The United States granted her father legal entry to work and live, in the, and, and live in the U.S., but he was not permitted to bring his family for one year before they entered without documents in order to be reunited with her father in, in Los Angeles. Tanya, her mother, and her two brothers survived amidst the, es the escalating violence in the capital of San, of San Salvador. She and her family were granted legal uh, residency in the U.S. through the Reagan administration immigration reform and the Control Act of 1986, five years after their initial arrival. Her experience as an immigrant has defined her, has defined her identity and purpose and professional education and personal endeavors. She has chosen to, to dedicate her professional life as a community college instructor because she identifies with the struggle and setbacks that many of our students face. She uses her immigrant experience to help them discover their identity and overcome systematic obstacles in their academic goals. She, she earned her BA in French in the University of Southern California and her MA in Spanish literature from the University of California, Santa Barbara. She has been teaching Spanish at Ventura College since 2006 and lives in Ojai with her husband and three teenage ch children. I now welcome Professor Tanya de Clark to speak. Thank you. Thank you for the great introduction and uh, thank you for welcoming welcoming me here today and inviting me to present 
Uh, it's been uh, an event organized by the Associate Students of Ventura College, so I am grateful to be a part of this. And if you'll just give me just a second here to set up my um, PowerPoint, then I can start sharing that with you. And hopefully, there we go, I can see everything. Uh, okay, just need to adjust a few windows here. Okay, so uh, a lot of the data that you're going to see in the next couple slides is information that I prepared uh, when I was on sabbatical preparing the Spanish 3S course which is the Spanish for Heritage Speakers. It is a course that is designed for students who already speak Spanish fluently and who want to improve their literacy in the language. Many of you have probably heard of native speakers courses uh, in high school, which is the term that was formally used, but currently, actually more recently, we've started to differentiate between heritage speakers of Spanish and native speakers of Spanish. So um, to, to, to differentiate those two, basically native speakers are uh, speakers of Spanish who were born in a Spanish speaking country and who have had schooling in the language where Spanish was the primary language of instruction. So those are students who perhaps went to elementary school or uh, middle school or high school in a Spanish speaking country and so therefore they have a higher literacy rate of Spanish because they've been schooled in the language versus heritage speakers which are students who have grown up in the United States and have a very high fluency rate uh, for speaking and listening skills but may not have uh, as high of a literacy rate because they've only had access to the language in a spoken format because they've been going to school in an English only uh, school system. So that's just to differentiate that. So uh, the reason that I did the research for uh, the identity of these heritage speakers is because I found it necessary in order to know how to meet their linguistic needs in my Spanish for Heritage Speakers course. So uh, the data that you're going to see here is a lot of the data that I pulled from the Pew Research Center when they did a survey of Hispanics living in the United States on the topic of language and identity. So I am going to be comparing uh, what the national survey said and what our Ventura College students say uh, about language and identity. So I have, uh, I decided to use a lot of the same questions that the survey used and tweaked a few to be more directly related to my particular course. Uh, but the questions, some of the questions that were asked in the Pew survey, I've asked of my students since I started teaching the class in the fall of 2018. So it's been about um, four semesters of data collection of uh, hearing what their answers are. So you'll see the data on the left is the VC students and the data on the right is how it compares to the national survey. So let's take a look at some of this. Before we jump into it, I do want to take a brief moment to just define the terms in case you're starting to feel uh, the alphabet soup confusion of what's the correct term. Um, so there are so many terms that are out there. Uh, so let's just start with a, a quick little recap of what are all these terms. So Chicano and Chicana is basically defined as a person of Mexican descent, born and residing in the US, uh, who has, uh, I'm just going to read from here, sorry, I have to turn to the side, who has a political consciousness of himself or herself as a member of, historic, of a historically oppressed group. And I'm sure that um, Professora Gamboa will speak to the social movement later on of the Chicano movement, uh, and she'll help us understand the historically oppressed group term in more detail. And a Mexican-American is basically defined as a U.S. American national of Mexican descent, born and living in the U.S. I'm sorry, I'm going to have to move 
a few little things around here. I'm trying to um, see multiple windows at the same time. So I might have to just turn to the side. So a uh, Mexican or a Mexicano or a Mexicana, these are Mexican nationals born in Mexico, residing, residing either in the US or in Mexico. In other words, they're born in Mexico uh, and most of the time they could be US citizens, residents, uh, but that is the term of origin that they prefer to identify with. Latino, Latina, or as we've most recently started using the term Latinx, is a person residing in the United States who is of Latin American origin or descent, regardless of race, language, or culture. So I'm going to emphasize a little bit that last part of the definition, regardless of race, language, or culture. Um, so as you'll see with the definition of the term Hispanic, Latino, Latina, Latinx as an identity label uh, is arguably uh, just as broad as the term Hispanic is uh, for being or for attempting to be racially and culturally neutral, um, but not gender neutral, right? The Latino, Latina is not gender neutral, which is why we've moved on to the Latinx uh, term to be more inclusive of all genders. And there's a lot of debate as to uh, should we just leave it Latino or should we use Latinx? Uh, and I think the term Latino, Latinx is not only more inclusive of all genders, but I think it's a way of helping to diminish the patriarchal structure of the Spanish language, which favors the masculine form when referring to a mixed gender group. So uh, in Spanish, if, if in case you've never taken a Spanish class, you, know, you may not know that an O at the end of a word indicates the masculinity of the noun, right? And that is what we use even when it's a group of, let's say, you know, 500 men and one woman, or vice versa, 500 women and one man, we would use Latino as the general term. Right, so um, I think Latinx breaks away from the patriarchy of the structure of the language itself. Uh, so uh, that's just one of the arguments why the Latinx term has been uh, introduced. And the next term, Hispanic, well, this was a, a government created term to identify a person residing in the US with ancestry from a Spanish-speaking country, regardless of race. So again, another very broad term. Uh, it's been used nearly for four de decades since the US government mandated its use uh, in things like the census, for example. Uh, and it basically categorizes Americans who trace their roots to Spanish-speaking countries. Uh, and as you can see from all of these labels, um, oh, a little bit more on um, so in the in 1980 census, actually, the term Spanish race slash Hispanic was the term that was used to categorize the Latino population. Uh, and as you'll see later on from both the national survey and my own student survey, you'll see that this term Hispanic is the most widely rejected uh, because it's an oversimplification and homogenizing term of the diverse peoples of Latin America. So you'll see how our students rarely use the term Hispanic. So uh, it's definitely the, a label that has not been embraced by the community and not only not embraced, but has really been rejected. So this is the first slide that shows what the national survey says when it comes to describing their identity, what term do, and I'm gonna throw out lots of terms here, Hispanics, Latinx, <laughs> whatever this community prefers. Um, but the term that they prefer to identify with is the um, family's country of origin. So for example, using such terms as I'm Mexican, I'm Cuban, I'm Salvadoran, or I'm Puerto Rican. Uh, if I had answered the survey, I would have answered very similar to the 51% uh, 
of the Hispanics who participated. If somebody asks me um, what my preferred ethnic term is, I would say I'm salvadoreña before I said I'm Hispanic, Latina, or any of the other terms. Uh, so I can definitely relate to that. Um, as you'll see here, about a quarter of them used the term Hispanic or Latino. Um, again, this was before we were really using Latinx as our term. Uh, and then 21% uh, say they use the term American most often. And as you'll see in the next slide, that varies greatly once we get into different generational preferences. So, uh, and then if you look uh, here, um, well, only the 4% who didn't really answer the question. So let's take a look at um, the usage of these terms across um, different generations, because as you can see from this uh, slide here, there is a generational shift in identity. In the first generation, 62% identify with the country of origin. And by the third generation, over 70% no longer identify with the country of origin, but rather as American or Latino or Hispanic. And nearly 50% of the third generation respondents identify as American. So you really see how that shifts throughout the generations. And we might hypothesize that this shift in identity is closely linked to the acquisition of English. Uh, and also noteworthy is that uh, all three generations uh, rejected the term Hispanic or Latino. So. And then now let's talk about our Ventura College students. So how um, do our students here at Ventura College identify? And remember, this is a survey of my uh, heritage speakers. So these are all students who speak Spanish fluently, right? I'm not uh, talking about the general Ventura College population. I'm talking about those students who have taken my uh, Spanish 3S course, right? But the most significant part of this number here is the total rejection of the term American by VC students. You see that's the small 1% category. Um, I have not directly asked my students why they reject this term so strongly. For right now, I've just been collecting the data. That'll come later on. Um, but I have three hypotheses of why these heritage speakers would reject the term American. Why living in the United States, and probably most of them having been born here, would not identify as American. Uh, and my first hypothesis is their language and the identity that they relate to their Spanish speaking skills. Uh, all of my students in this survey uh, are fluent Spanish speakers and uh, for the most part also fluent English speakers. I've had a few uh, who are recent arrivals from Mexico, uh, but in general, they seem to equate Spanish speaking as non-American, even when they've grown up and they speak English fluently. My second uh, guess is the geography. Uh, living in Southern California and because they're a part of a community where they identify with that community, I think creates uh, that um, difference for them. So the discrepancy between the Pew survey, which is the numbers on the right, uh, and the results of my sur survey uh, may point to a greater sense of our students belonging to a Hispanic or Latino community in Ventura County and in Southern California. Uh, so for example, take someone, a Hispanic or Latino who uh, lives in Iowa, right? They might be less likely to identify as a linguistic minority than those who are part of a, a broader community of people like them who also speak Spanish uh, or who have um, Spanish speaking origins, right? And then a last one is uh, the third possibility is the politicization of the term American under the current administration, right? And the uh, feelings, mixed feelings that people have about that. 
All right. Um, can somebody just give me a little update on how much longer I have? You have about five to six minutes left. Okay. All right. I'll try to go uh, maybe a little faster. The next couple slides don't have as much uh, data on them. Uh, in terms of language uh, use, what, uh, whether or not it's necessary to speak Spanish to be considered Latino. So this is the um, numbers from the Pew uh, National Survey. Uh, so you can see here that what's most noteworthy is the discrepancy between the views of the foreign-born Latinos and the U.S.-born Latinos. But you can see that uh, a majority uh, you know, of, of both of these categories, whether they're foreign-born or U.S.-born, 71% of them say that it's not necessary to speak uh, Spanish in order to identify as Latinx. Uh, and the U.S.-born, that percentage is even higher. 87% of them say it's not necessary to speak Spanish in order to identify with this group. Uh, so this is where our Ventura College students uh, compare with that. So when I've asked my students, do you need to speak Spanish? You can see it pretty much mirrors what the national surveys say. So uh, with the difference of 3%, so 75% of our students say no, we don't have to speak Spanish in order to identify with this group. Uh, when asked to identify what language they prefer to speak, and again, remember, these are students that speak uh, English and Spanish uh, fluently. Uh, they're, most of them said no preference. So that just speaks to their bilingual skills. And 39% of them uh, said that they prefer English and 11% of them say they prefer Spanish. Uh, when I asked them about their, how they feel if their culture is valued in our community. Uh, unfortunately, as you can see from here, 69% of them say they do not feel valued. Uh, and 31% said that they do. So that's something that I think we have a lot of work to do. Uh, and I think we're talking a lot at Ventura College of how to change curriculum, how to change so that these students feel like they're a part and that they can identify with our instructors, you know, to change our hiring practices, and also that they identify with the course content, the material they're reading. Uh, so again, this is where we have a lot of work to do, right, is how do we get these students to feel like they're part of this community? When keep in mind, most of these students have grown up here uh, and they still feel like they're outsiders in our community. And in terms of cultural identity, uh, when asked whether uh, all Latinx people share the same cu um, culture, uh, nearly all the Ventura College students who were surveyed said no. And the chart on the right is the national survey. Uh, obviously, that's a bigger number. Uh, it's about 1,200 respondents to the um, national survey. So you can see that it's still a majority of people, overwhelming number of students who say that the Latinx community uh, do not share the same culture, right? Um, so I think this indicates their awareness of the cultural diversity of Latinx peoples. Uh, and it also underscores the fallacy of uh, the terms Latinx or Hispanic, uh, which falsely imply that all of these people can be cat categorized together, right? So um, it's just, it's really a broad brushstroke of trying to put them all in one category. And I'd like to end uh, with this quote uh, from Ibram X. Kendi and Jason Reynolds' book, Stamped, which is part of our uh, One Book, One Campus. Uh, and I'll just read it off to you here. The concept of race has always been used to gain and keep power whether financially or politically, it has always been used to create dynamics that separate us to keep us quiet, to keep the ball of white and rich privilege rolling. And that is not woven into people as much as it is woven into policy. And I would add there into language as well, that people adhere to 
and believe is truth. Um, so I guess in my closing overall, the reason why I accepted this invitation to present here is because I think our students' heads start to spin. It's like, oh, what do I do? What term do I use, right? It seems like they're all so controversial. Um, and really my recommendation to you, if you know, you're looking for that identity, I mean, I've struggled through it all my life, right? I was born in El Salvador, I came to the United States. I mean, I remember wondering whether or not it was okay for me to speak Spanish in public, uh, you know, where it just, that rejection and that feeling of, you know, being less good, you know, than the status quo is definitely ex an experience that I've endured throughout my life. And I would say to you that um, choose the term that you identify most with as opposed to the term that is imposed on you, right? So always put your critical thinking skills on and say, well, okay, Latinx, that seems to be the latest hot term, right? Now question, okay, is that the one that fits me most? And also examine the historical and social implications and because all of those terms come out of some kind of social movement, right? Um, some kind of social context. Uh, Aras, um, Ruizela, uh, Professora Gamboa and I spent a good amount talking about, oh, well, what do your students choose? Do they choose Chicano Chicana? And well, as we saw from the numbers, that's not the preferred term, right? Somebody who came out of the Chicano movement uh, you know, the older generations would say, what, how come they're not using that term, right? And so um, no way can you ever impose and say, this is the term that you should use, right? So I just encourage you to inform yourself and educate yourselves of what do all of these terms mean? What are the implications? Where do they come from? And to use that as your foundation for choosing a term or a label. Um, but as you'll see, it's difficult, right, to put everybody in one category and to label them as such. So I'll end with there, and then I think Professora Gamboa will take it from here, and she'll speak much more to the social movements of the Chicano movement. Yes, thank you, Professor. I learned a lot from your presentation. I especially like the quote that comes from the Kenny, uh, ex Kenny and John and Jason Reynolds book, the stamped uh, book called Stamped. I really like that quote and it actually sparked an interest in mine to read that book as well. So thank you for that. Good, I'm glad. You can to get to the very end because it's from the afterward. <laughs> <laughs> thank but you. It's very easy to read. Thank you. And now it is my pleasure to introduce to you Professor Gamboa. Professor Gamboa was originally from the Yakima Valley, am I saying it correct, Professor Gamboa? Yakima. Yakima Valley in Washington State. She grew in, she grew up on the Yakima Re uh, Reservation with a farm worker family. She is a first generation college student and earned a BA in history from Eastern Washington University and a master's degree in, in Mexican American studies from the, from the University of Arizona. Professor Gamboa has contributed contributed to research focusing on the undocumented un, undocumented migrant experience in the context of the criminal injustice system and health concerns at the Arizona and Mexico border. She also worked on under project export and on the prevention of drug use among Latino youth and adolescents sexual risk behaviors. She's the advisor for the VC Mecha and a member of Lucha. Her passion in life has been to make a difference through higher education, guiding students in understanding Native American and Chicano and Chicano Chicano history, self-identify and self-consciousness. I now introduce to you Professor Camboa. Thank you. Thank you, Enrique. Can everyone hear me? Yes. I, I want to share my screen. It says host disabled participation screen sharing. I don't know if we can. 
We are working on giving you those capabilities okay. right now. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <Thanks> bye. <laughs> All right, so uh, thank you. Um, I'm very um, honored to be also asked um, to do this presentation. Um, I teach Chicano studies at Ventura College, also Native American studies um, within the history department. And so I would like to share with you um, a very important topic when it comes to um, I also inclusion of identity, um, especially when we look at Chicana and Chicano. Uh, can you see my slide? Yes, okay. So beginning with the conversation of Chicana student movements is where we start to uh, get into Chicana, Chicano identity because it is, it is a, a movement led identity. It's a political uh, I ideology and identity. And so we have to have some backstory first before I can just jump into student activism and uh, movements. First, we need to talk about the, the issues that students were facing during the 1960s of when these movements come about. There's family gaps, there's disparities that are occurring um, nationwide. Um, in the data I'm going to be sharing with you, most of it is from California, but do understand that this is uh, across the board in every state that you can imagine where Chicanas and Chicanos reside. So coming from Washington State, I always make sure that I'm very uh, uh, critical of that because most people would assume just Texas or just the Southwest. But as you can see, I came from Washington State with the Pacific Northwest. So the disparities and the gaps, uh, in the 1960s, most heads of households had less than nine years of education. Um, when we look at nationwide and we look at the data, um, when doing Chicano studies, we become more specific on the Mexican identity as that is part of the ancestry. Um, Mex Mexican education here in the 1960s was less than eight years of education um, during the civil rights era. Um, unemployment was almost doubled the national average. And in California, uh, Chicano earned 69.5% of white male wages. And then nationally, when we look at Mexicans in 1960, that was 70%. When we break it down and we look at females, as we know, there are bigger gaps when we do that. Um, Chicanos earned 34.1% um, with white male wages. And when those of you that might be wondering, well, what about today? Well, um, more recent data uh, in this graph is showing you um, the wage gap and is how much less in percent terms. So there's obviously a closer gap between white women and white males versus the solid orange line of um, Hispanic men and the dotted line for Hispanic women. So from here, looking at the, the wage gap, looking at the educational disparities, you also see politically there's um, underrepresentation as a result of gerrymandering that occurs politically. Um, there's communities that are organized for purposes to deny uh, a voice in the community and also exclude um, from the political process as far as um, jury, not, not being allowed to be involved in a jury um, because of the specific requirements of having to speak English. And if so, if you only spoke Spanish, you weren't allowed um, to participate in that. So another issue that is, um, it's a misconception, and, and that is that uh, students have, uh, have had the opportunity um, to engage on an equal level in education. And most people will attribute the Brown versus Board of Education case of 1954, where um, that was supposed to end the segregation of schools. However, there's loopholes within that. Um, and even with the passing of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, we continue to see the segregation of African American and Mexican American, Native American and Asian Americans um, because of the loopholes. Well, what's the loophole? Well, the loophole is that, I, that racial part. Uh, Mexicans have been identified as being white. And so because they were identified as being white, then there's the loophole. Um, and, the communities were able to fulfill the integration law 
by denying the denying the admittance of other white students by identifying the Mexicans as the white students. So if you had a bunch of uh, African American youth and Mexican American, then you were not um, segregating them. They were participating. Um, now that obviously there's there's some issues because we know that the Mexican American is not white. And so it's not until 1968 where you see Chicano parents um, filing suit in a Supreme Court case. And in that Supreme Court case, which is known as Cisneros versus Corpus Christi Independent School District, that is where you finally get uh, um, the, the Supreme Court decision saying that it's against the 14th Amendment um, to deny the rights of these individuals. And so then that's when we start to see these educational gaps um, as barely starting to shift forward. So students, right, students that are in this system, in this educational um, uh, participation of being denied access and then in the 1960s barely having the opportunity to participate are facing many disparities and what's happening in the community is essential to understand there is a movement that they're witnessing in front of their eyes there is a leader right martin luther king has been coming forward he's been marching um, there's interaction between uh, multi uh, groups of people of color that are creating a plan of action and you have the march on washington that most people were exposed to and were aware of and awakened by a new sense of activism and so what Martin Luther King was um, hoping to achieve and participate in was a interracial gain. Chicanos coming together, Native Americans coming together, Asian Americans coming together on the Poor People's Campaign. Now, unfortunately, that is when Dr. King is assassinated and he's not able to participate in that Poor People Campaign. However, leaders continued that struggle and students are watching these things happen and students are participating in this struggle. And so you have uh, in the image here, um, uh, uh, representation from the Chicano movement, from the American Indian movement, and also from the African American civil rights movement all coming together. And you also have specific leadership. I mean, this is a very quick, just know that you're getting a tip of the iceberg in terms of um, student activism and movement. But what you have is leaders like uh, Rodolfo Corky Gonzalez uh, from Denver, the Crusade for Justice, that is leading a contingent, uh, a plan call, calling on the issues that are affecting students, better housing, better education, uh, business opportunities. Um, there's so many conversations that are taking place and the realization that the poor people and people of color have in common. So this unfortunately wouldn't bring about the change that's needed as we are still having the same conversations of the civil rights movement, but it would gain visibility and so that students would know that they have had a past. There's leaders that have done this before. And so what we see is uh, an, another example of how students can become involved in today's movement. So from here, we're looking at um, other images that are happening that students are participating in and they're looking at and they're uh, getting ideas of what they can do in their communities. So the United Farm Workers, as being in part of uh, Ventura County, you should be aware of who the United Farm Workers are um, as an agriculture community. First, we have two groups that come together, the Filipino farm workers and the Mexican American farm workers that are gathering, um, organizing, trying to um, fight against racism, discrimination, and disparities in the workplace, and creating what we now know as the United Farm Workers. Here, I want to introduce these symbols, these images that are part of the Chicano student movements that are incorporated within that identity. And um, it is a very powerful image as we look forward. So when um, we look at what the colors uh, represent, we have the white for hope, we have the black for the struggle, and the red for that sacrifice that we're making of our time and our energy and participation. And knowing that we do have people who have died in these um, um, student movements and activism. So 
from 1965 to 1970, you have students who can actually see on television the great boycott that's happening in Delano. And so students are very much politicized and awakened by what they're seeing that parents and as farm workers are doing. Other images around the Southwest, you have Reyes Lopez Tejerina, who has opened up a whole new group as far as um, making the United States government pay attention to the treaty that it signed after the Mexican-American War, which is the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. And here, this activist is reclaiming our access to that land, reclaiming our identity. And this goes also into what the Chicano identity will also be utilizing is Aslan. Aslan, the homeland of where native people originated from, which is the Southwest of the United States. So to restore the legal rights of Mexicans, as Mexicans have not had political representation, as they have been denied those, um, this was that movement. So we're also witnessing this incorporation that students will mimic in their student organizations. And how do they get it out? Well, just like today, what we see with Black Lives Matter and students that are organizing like Mecha, they're using social media Right today we have Twitter and uh, Facebook and and other accounts that I am sure I'm already outdated, but back then you, what you had were newspapers, right? Good old newspapers. Um, in 1967, students are organizing themselves by writing their own newspapers, um, their their own editors. Their um, first you have them appearing in um, major centers and communities such as Los Angeles. You have the Inside East Side newspaper that is written by high school students. You have also the Chicano Student Movement newspaper that's very political and very active in talking about organizing. You also have um, uh, students that are not just political, but uh, how do you get people to read things? Well, you put some interesting things in there like uh, dances and uh, you know, uh, new, uh, new movement, new um, ideas and movements that are happening that are social, doing social work, doing socializing. But the main concept of the newspaper was school disparities. School disparities is what brings the student movement forward. So you have in the 1960s, the educational disparities. One out of four Chicano students completed high school. The dropout rate in one of the high schools of the student activists um, was 57.5%, 57, 57, almost 60% of their students were dropping out of high school. Um, they did not employ very many uh, teachers that represented the student, um, they, the student body. The average class size was 40 students. And the ratio of counselors was one counselor for 4,000 students. That is a huge disparity in why students were not gaining access to higher education or being pushed into higher education. So when they're facing this racism, I'd like, I always like to refer to a great PBS series, um, Chicano. And so I do want to share a, a video clip of this with you. I started elementary school in the uh, early 1950s, and I was uh, the only student in my uh, kindergarten class that was a monolingual Spanish-speaking child. And uh, I was immediately led to the front of the class, and uh, I was instructed on how to uh, create a cone hat out of uh, construction paper. Uh, the teacher painted a word on it and told me I could take it off when I learned to speak English, and the word she had painted on that was the word Spanish. I remember going to elementary school taking my tacos of uh, frijoles and meat and rice and being made fun of by the other kids in, in, in junior high especially to the point where I didn't want to take tacos that come to school. I wanted to take bologna sandwiches. I remember feeling ashamed, you know, when my father would go to school because he didn't speak good English and translating for him, feeling ashamed of being Mexican, and which fed this growing anger in me. And I think those same things were, you know, infecting everyone else, and everyone responded in a different way. The burden was pretty heavy, you know, in terms of the shame of not feeling that your parents were worth anything, because the teachers and schools treated them like children. 
There were clear signs of prejudice and discrimination. I remember vividly when I was an honor student being asked by the white consular what my father did for a living and me telling her, well, you know, uh, he's a laborer, you know, uh, he works with his hands. And then she told me, and I'll never forget this, these were the exact words, that is a very honorable profession. You should follow in your father's footsteps. My homemaking teacher, she would say, you know, you little Mexicans, you better learn and pay attention. This class is very important because, you know, uh, most of you are going to be cooking and cleaning for other people. It was real clear to me that there was a definite tracking system. Some students went into um, the academia tracking and were, were, were being prepared to go to college. Others were being tracked into going to the shop classes, into the vocational areas. It wasn't that there was anything wrong with, with that, but you didn't have a choice. You were tracked into those areas. So from looking at those testimonies from students that were involved, students that participated in the student-led movement um, and the walkouts that this video is talking about, um, is talking about how Spanish was banned from the from their institution, they were how they were made to be, uh, how they felt about that, right? Of being embarrassed, also being embarrassed of their own family, um, students that were being punished, um, curriculum that lacked representation, and Mexican food that was completely banned, um, not allowing to use restrooms during breaks, and then the high dropout rates that was uh, talked about as being pushout rates, where students were not um, that these um, ideas that students were bringing forward were just being ignored. And so that for being a push out, knowing that this was happening and not doing anything about it. So then the last part is this, this tracking of vocational. So because of these things, we have students that are also recognizing what's happening outside of the educational system, and that's the policing of their communities. This is where we have the introduction of student movement of Brown Berets. We have students joining these, participating in them, um, not as many would think as the militant group, but people protecting themselves from police brutality. Right. So December 3rd, 1967 is when this is uh, initiated and, it, and it hap it's, it's sad why it happens. You have police who are entering into homes and, um, you know, shooting people inside of their homes when, you know, it's a baptismal party and there was no reason to do something like that. You have students that are organizing themselves in Los Angeles, called, um, in, the, in a place called La Piraña. You have grassroots organizing of different levels. You have university students, you have college students, you have high school students that are coming together to talk about the disparities in the schools and the disparities in their communities. So what ends up being also introduced is the fighting for self-determination as part of the Chicano student movement. So the wearing of the brown beret, this is again um, also shown with um, the African-American movement and the Black Panther Party. When we, what we need to recognize what comes through these movements, these student-led movements, is also more information, um, the gathering of knowledge, because the local newspapers didn't want to write about these things. Um, so students wrote about them themselves. This was their social media. Um, you also have uh, the Brown Berets that participated in organizing one of the first free medical clinics in the communities and giving free breakfast to their families. That's kind of like what's always ignored about the benefits and, and the social movement of students and what they're doing in, in these groups. Now, when students organize this organization, much of it takes place around the year of 1968, where you have those student walkouts and students that are finally stepping forward and realizing that they need to um, take action. And it's because they have this high school dropout rate that exists, the overcrowding and rundown schools that they're in, um, the unequal education. And then you have faculty as mentors. Here you have an image here of Sal Castro. Sal Castro was what students need. 
they need advocates. They need people to help them and guide them. And South Castro was that for our California students. So the tracking of the students into low skilled jobs was a huge issue to step away from that. And access to universities was one of the big conversations is how can we get students to get that educational gap disparity gone? How do we push them into these colleges? And so students went out, they met political leaders. Here you have them meeting with Robert Kennedy and talking about we need people from higher up to help us in these places where nobody's paying attention. And so in this representation and in this activism what you have is also outside and the bigger picture is a war the war at vietnam that's occurring and how students organize themselves um, august 29 1970 becomes the chicano moratorium where 30,000 individuals go um, now this is students this is educators this is community organizers fighting against what's happening in front of them in their communities, that there's a huge disparity. Mexican-Americans were 10% of the population, but were 20% of the deaths that were occurring in Vietnam. And so in this, you have students doing a peaceful march, um, but unfortunately, police brutality comes in and you have the death of, of uh, four individuals, including um, our leader, Los Angeles columnist, uh, Ruben Salazar. So from here, as students are organizing and they're, and they're feeling like there's this huge struggle that is beyond just education, now they start to come to terms with, well, who else is experiencing this? Because this is not just happening in Los Angeles. This is happening in Colorado. This is happening in Texas and in um, Oklahoma and in Chicago. So we have images that are coming in. Those symbols start to turn back. The United Farm Workers symbol, um, students organizing poetry, music, the Spanish language, all of that comes into play with identity and Chicano identity. And so uh, Rodolfo Corte Gonzalez is known for the poem, I Am Joaquin. And I Am Joaquin becomes this uh, inaugural work that um, shows a literary renaissance of Chicano work. And it talks about how Chicano identity goes back to the origins of being indigenous. And it serves as a consciously uh, ideological function. It addresses all the conflicting identities that comes along with it. And also with that, we have the student conferences that now are organizing. These are national organizations coming together, organizing themselves. The first National Chicano Youth Conference happened in 1969. And you have, <clears throat> excuse me, poet Alorista, who brings and introduces a poem that transforms and is produced as a document and which is known as the spiritual plan de Aslan. And this is talking about what is it as students do we want to address? That's ethnic nationalism, self-determination, cultural and racial pride, independent political action. So as you see, when we talk about Chicana and Chicano identity, it becomes political. It becomes a, a statement. It's something that you choose as something that you're pursuing um, in self-determination and anti-discrimination. So to combat structural racism, to encourage cultural revitalization, to achieve community empowerment, and by rejecting assimilation into that process that has been denying them participation. And from there, and what's beautiful is that this right here is local, right? El Plan de, uh, de Santa Barbara. This happens um, at UC Santa Barbara in 1969, where you have students who are already organized, students who are in UMAS, um, who are in Mayo, who come together and they, and they come with faculty, they come with community members, and they decide on two major things here. We have the movement of Chicano students national group, which is Mecha. The creation of Mecha and all the student group led organizations under one umbrella, one organization, so that they could be stronger. And then also the creation of Chicano studies. From here, another student-led group that involves others is known as the Third World Liberation Front. 1968, you have the Black Student Union that organizes in San Francisco State University. And they're talking about the disparities in the universities that students are not being allowed to enroll. Students are not achieving um, uh, a, or getting a curriculum that is inclusive. Um, there's uh, a, 
a, also a coalition of a multiracial group of students of color, of Chicanas, Asians, Native Americans, talking about what is it that we're demanding at the universities and that also at the colleges and that's acknowledging the histories of communities of color as vital scholarships through the creation of the third world college hire of people of color so african americans native americans chicanos chicanas and asian americans all want to see that representation in teachers and in the curriculum and so they wanted to create a university however they didn't get that after three months of protesting what they got was the department of ethnic studies so what have student organizations created they've created curriculum they've created a department now we just got to embrace it and we got to say that is what we're going to welcome here at ventura college so i would like to also end you with some quotes um, with um from rudolfo I'm, I'm sorry, Rudy Acuna. Um, this is from his book, Occupied America. They neither know nor learn about the sacrifices that earlier generations of Chicanos and Mexican Americans made when them their win them their access to opportunities. And most take college admission for granted. Increasingly, students go to college for material gains rather than the benefit of society. So unfortunately, as with the data that uh, Professor um, de Clark has shown, unfortunately students are not aware of this history. They're not aware of that cultural identity and if we're not really sure why they would choose that. And so most of the time people who have that choice or that moving forward are, are students that have taken Chicano study courses. So thank you, I appreciate your time and uh, I believe we'll open up for questions. Thank you, Professor Kimbo. I learned a lot from your presentation as well. I remember when I was in high school, my local Mecha would go to UCSB for a Congreso when they would invite other Mecha uh, organizations and different social organizations as well to go speak for a two day period. And it would everything would be free. You just have to go and show up. And it was a wonderful experience. And I hope that they can turn into a virtual experience with everything going on now. And I just want to say thank you once again for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. And then now I believe we, we will open it up for questions, correct Libby? Yes, definitely. So now if any students or staff or faculty um, in the webinar have any questions for our guest speaker, um, now is the time to ask. So I saw one question that just popped up in the chat uh, from Randy Hernandez saying, could you address the issue of the indigenous identity? And uh, if I can ask Ray, would that be towards Professor DeClark or Professor Kamboa? And then he said it was towards Professor Kumbo. Um, When addressing indigenous identity, what, as I was mentioning earlier, when we talk about Chicano, being Chicana, being Chicano, that incorporates that you understand that we come from indigenous roots as being an indigenous population to the Americas. And so reclaiming that and not being ashamed of that and not denying it as what happened through Spanish colonization and also colorism and the caste system that pushed that forward. So as a Chicana and Chicano, when I, I identify myself as a Chicana, so when I do that, I'm reclaiming what was taken, knowing that I'm obviously, you know, a mixed person. I, I've done my DNA, so I know exactly what I have, but, um, but I claim Chicana. I claim that ancestry of being indigenous and having indigenous roots, right? That's the roots. Where does the tree come from, right? You follow those roots into that native um, identity. Thank you. You know, I can add to that with my own personal experiences, but, um, you know, I, I haven't done the DNA test, but I know that I have an indigenous mestizaje 
uh, background and um, going back to uh, the video that uh, Professora Gamboa played uh, with that shame that people feel, you know, and I can honestly speak to um, in El Salvador, since that's where I'm from, the, there is still a hierarchy amongst the Latino gender population there, right, in terms of like who looks more indigenous, who looks less indigenous, and I think part of the reason that I was able to avoid um, uh, racism so much throughout my life is because I was able to kind of fly under the radar because I'm considered on the lighter side if you compared me to other Salvadoreños who maybe don't look as Salvadoreño or as uh, indigenous, right? I've always been uh, able to sort of blend in and, and that shame that people feel. I think when we see the data of how people report for their race, you know, um, a lot of times they will choose white because of the shame, because of, you know, being, having been put down and that not being the favored choice, right? And so uh, that's definitely, um, even within the Latino culture, uh, something that you have the racism against indigenous people within that culture. I mean, we see it with the Mixteco community, right? And, you know, uh, are, wh where do they fit in when really, oh, are they Mexican, you know, are they Chicano, you know, I mean, it's, it's just, I think that's where you see the real complicated part of these identity labels, right, is that it's hard because we are a mixture. Thank you. And then, so we had one question from B. Rodriguez. Do you have stats or demographics for VCCCD? I believe we can get those information from our college website. I used to know what they were before the new website came out, but at this time, Libby, would you happen to know where they're from? Where are we where we be able to get them? Um, I. I believe they're on the Institutional Effective Research page. I will look for that right now, and I will put it in the chat if I'm able to find it real quick. Um, Thank you. Yeah. And then we have another question from Francisco. This is a, a question for Professor Gamboa or Professor DeClark. In your opinion, what do you think is the level of education in the Latino community in Ventura County in comparison with the other like Anglos, Asian, or Afro-Americans? Do you believe that it is important factor, it is an important factor to influence presence in the community? If it is, what do you suggest? I'm sorry, I missed the first, the first part of that question. Okay, I'll, I'll repeat it. It says, in your opinion, do you think it is, the, uh, do you think is the level, what do you think is the level of education in the Latino community in Ventura County in comparison with the other, like Anglos, Asians, and, Afri and Afro-Americans? I unfortunately have not collected the data specifically for Ventura County to, to give you that information but I'm sure we can find it. Uh, basically, I'm sorry. Uh, basically, I'm not asking for data. I'm asking about your opinion. What do you think that is the level of education of the Latino community in comparison with another uh, people? Because uh, I think education is one of the most important factors and we are not doing anything to improve our level of education. So in your opinion, do you have any suggestions to improve, especially in the Latino community? Okay, so there's a few things that have taken place that we need to support and push forward. And that is um, the K through 12 system has now um, created an ethnic studies requirement to graduate high school in the Oxnard Unified School District and Ventura Unified School District. We need to support those programs. We need to support student organizations 
um, students that are voicing opinions, we need to support that. So in the, in the community, we need an outreach into the community as far as the access to higher education that we have. We need to support counselors, um, especially within the K through 12 system of what are the opportunities for in higher education? What are the degrees that you can get? Here at Ventura College, we just got our uh, Chicano Studies um, AAT degree. So, you know, pushing that forward and having the institution help push those uh, ideas and uh, um, way to gain higher access. I think if, if we're able to um, acknowledge that we have resources, we're just not pointing them in the right direction and our energy with um, our youth that are in the high school system, because I believe in the pipeline, right? You have to get in the pipeline to get into community college and then to get to the university. So I, I, I hope that helps in answering your question, Francisco. Uh, yes, in part, thank you very much. Uh, my question was basically in regards to the um, motivation of people to get in a very great of education. Uh, I've been talking to a lot of families and a lot of uh, people who work and they don't see any, any way, uh, any good result going to college, going or complete any kind of studies. They say, I mean, school is worthless for me. Uh, they rather to work in construction, uh, get another type of business, but no, they are not considered that education, uh, I'm talking about trying to go to college, university is not as important as to make money to sustain the family. So what I'm thinking is probably is no the resources is a motivation that you can provide to the Latino families and say, well, do you want to get a better status? You, you want to be recognized in this society? You have to be educated. That's my question. The, the, the interesting thing there is part of indigenous identity and indigenous methodology is not thinking about yourself and how most institutions will say, well, what can you do? How can you make money? And that's what we don't want students to have in their minds is just money. It's like, no, how can we contribute? How can we contribute to our society? What kind of um, degree can I pursue that I'm gonna come back to my community and be an asset to my community? And that's through higher education, right? That, that's an indigenous methodology that I definitely encourage. And I want to add that, uh, I mean, I always encourage my students that we're here for learning's sake, right? We're not here to fulfill, just to fulfill the requirement or just to fulfill that, oh, I got this piece of paper that's going to, you know, earn me more money. But on the flip side, I mean, um, the, I think coming from a language perspective, uh, to go back, Francisco, to your original um, question is how can the school systems uh, increase the participation of those students so that they value education so it's not just you know going through the hoops uh, and I understand why they have that feeling of it's useless right why should I go to school it's it's not going to change my chances of getting a job when we have systemic racism right but what I tell my students is well, you're here in my Spanish class because you want to improve your Spanish skills because that is actually a quantifiable, uh, I tell them, a quantifiable skill that will increase your income, right? Look at um, the, you know, when they tell me how many students have I had that have told me, oh, I can make more money because of my bilingual skills, right? And so, Essentially, that's why I have students in the Heritage Speakers course who tell me, oh, I already speak Spanish, but I don't speak the proper Spanish that, you know, sounds good in a professional setting. And so they're fine tuning those skills. So really what we need is we, our educational system needs to stop um, oppressing these students through the curriculum, through the language of instruction, right? Uh, you may know that Ventura County, uh, Ventura Unified has, uh, you know, the dual immersion language program where students can learn in Spanish from kindergarten 
uh, all the way through high school, that's a step in the right direction, right? Because then students are going to feel valued if they're learning in their home language and if they feel that, uh, that those language skills can be related in an educational setting and they're learning about themselves. They're learning that Spanish is good. It's not something to be ashamed of, right? So by offering more uh, courses in Spanish, for example, uh, or you know, more curriculum choices where students are learning about themselves so that they feel empowered and strengthened, uh, then I think those are ways that we in the educational system can change that mentality of, why am I here? This is useless, right? What's it going to get me in the end? Well, yeah, basically, I, I was thinking not only about uh, the language or the school or the students. I was thinking more about the population, the community, even adults. Um, because uh, in the area, for example, of technology, if you're talking to an adult and say, hey, you have access online to, to many resources for your own education, and they say, well, let me tell my son about it because he knows most more about how to get into it. And normally I tell him, you don't have to tell your son, you have to do it yourself. You have to work yourself, improving your own general education in different areas. No, and if you're gonna speak Spanish, obviously you have to speak Spanish well, and you have to speak English well, and you have to know technology, and more education that you have is gonna be better. It's gonna put you in a better level economically and so in the society as well. So that was my question related to Thank you. Are there any more questions at this time? Hey, Libby, this is Peter Setsi. I was wondering if I could just make a comment. Yeah, that would be great. Yeah. So uh, to both Tanya and to Ruby Sella, I loved your presentations. And in particular, Ruby Sella, when you showed that clip from Chicano, that really struck a note with me. I don't think a lot of people know this, but my mom is Mexican-American and my dad was a refugee. They both spoke Spanish. And they were they were married in L.A. in the early 60s. And they only spoke Spanish at home. That was when they went on dates, when they were married, they were a Spanish couple. And one of the reasons why I don't speak Spanish well, I can do it conversationally, but not well, is because when they sent my eldest brother to preschool, the very first day he came back with a note pinned to his like shirt that said, please speak English at home. And I, I know in, in uh, linguistics, it, this is code switching. It's like as soon as that note came home, it was the same as that dunce cap or that, uh, that Spanish cap that uh, that clip showed. And that it, exactly what happened in the 60s when my brother, he, let's see, uh, in kindergarten, he was like 1968, around that same exact time. He was going to kindergarten preschool in L.A. My mom grew up in the projects. They were living in Boyle Heights at the time. They sent Mike to, to kindergarten. He came back with the note the very first day from kindergarten, said, speak English at home. So then my parents, okay, now when we talk to the kids, we speak English. So the parents would, my mom and dad would still speak Spanish to each other, but English to the kids. So then it became kind of like a secret language for my parents. I ended up learning it through a very kind of weird way later on, but I, I couldn't tell you how much I agreed with that clip, how it directly impacted my family. And then trying to learn Spanish later when I was in my 20s was a lot more challenging than if we would have just spoken it at home all the time. So I, I can listen and I can understand a lot more because I was always listening to whenever my parents were speaking. I was catching about 40% of what they were saying. And then fast forward to my mid-20s when I was in a situation where I had to speak Spanish to survive for six months. I learned it in a kind of interesting way, but had I learned it in the home, it would have been a lot better. So that, that clip, Rubicella, was just so, so timely. Uh, so I'm glad you shared that. And the labeling was so interesting too, because my mom who grew up in the projects, if you ask her what label she would use for herself, it's very 
interesting what she chose, even though Spanish was her language at home. Uh, my abuelita, she only spoke Spanish. She never spoke English. Uh, it, it's interesting how, how uh, people from different generations can sometimes chafe at certain labels. And, and it's never uniform. It's, you have to ask individually, everybody, what, what term do you prefer? Just an observation. <laughs> You know, I, I want to add just, uh, I, I didn't mention this as a, my personal story, but in high school, and now this is 1999, you know, um, I asked my counselors because there was no counseling. I, I had not, I received, I received zero counseling on going to higher education. And so I thought it upon myself, well, like, hmm, maybe I should go seek out a counselor about going to you know, university or college. And when I did, the counselor, you know, this is exactly what the counselor said as I sat with him. He said, I am not going to help you because you are not college material. And I was like, I walked away from that, like just crushed, right? And luckily, we had a Chicano studies counselor. Uh, I mean, not a Chicano studies, a Chicano who identified. Uh, uh, and I went to him. He was not my assigned counselor but I knew that he would be more supportive of me and which he was, and he immediately helped me. And I was like, why did the other person just completely say I'm not even material for that, right? So, you know, we're not talking about the 1960s here. <laughs> it's something that we still are facing uh, in our institutions. And to add a little bit to Peter's experience, I definitely have experienced that hearing my students say, uh, well, we used to speak Spanish when we were younger and then we stopped, you know, because my parents thought that it was going to hurt us not knowing, not being able to learn English well, you know, because Spanish was the only language at home. And so how many of them lost their Spanish skills from that? Uh, and like I shared with you earlier, I remember when my family first moved from El Salvador, we went to central Los Angeles in the Pico Union area, and I had friends who I could speak with comfortably on the school play yard before I spoke English, um, who I could speak to in Spanish. And then my dad decided that the schools were better in the white San Fernando Valley. So um, my brother was taking the school bus to go to a magnet school in the San Fernando Valley. And so my dad decided to move the family to San Fernando Valley so that we, my, we wouldn't have to sit on the school bus to go to the better suburban white schools. Uh, so he uprooted the family to Van Nuys and that's where I first experienced, huh, wow, nobody around here is speaking Spanish in public and wondering, you know, is it okay to speak Spanish in public? And, and then going back to that shame that you feel that was mentioned in the video, right? Um, and those, I think many of you were also in this morning's uh, talk with uh, Ibram Kendi and how he mentioned that, uh, you know, when, when people look down on you and you start to wonder, uh, is it okay for me to speak Spanish? Is, is Spanish the least favorable language because it's not what's used in schools? Uh, you know, you start to believe that and you start to internalize that. And so you start to feel less uh, than if you come from an English only uh, household, right? I remember that experience of feeling um, shameful. How many of us have been the translators for our parents, right? Because when they go to speak to a teacher, uh, they don't understand what the teacher's saying about their child in English. And so then you have the, you know, the young kids who are bilingual who are translating for the parents. And so this idea that, you know, um, it, it goes back to that idea of language as an oppressive tool, right? And, uh, you know, when bilingual education was outlawed, right? And what message that's sending. Uh, and then, you know, just when I think back, uh, of Ventura College used to teach a math class in Spanish. And so why did we stop doing that, right? 
I mean, why, I mean, that's just one way of how these um, students can identify with, look, I can learn Spanish, I can learn math in Spanish, and it's just as intelligent as it is in English. And then there was one final question from the chat that came from Tim Harrison. He said, great presentation. I would like to educate my young children and share it with others that may not get in K through 16. Do you recommend uh, a few great document, documentaries, books, or resources that educate them on this topic? And also, if you can please share your PowerPoint with the Ventura uh, Ventura College community, uh, it will be highly appreciated. So the question was, do you recommend any great, any doc, any great documentaries, books, or resources to help us educate the youth on this topic? Uh, there's definitely a lot out there. Um, I can compile a list and share it. Uh, I on the spot, I can't think of anything. I don't know if you can, Luisela, but you know, I have you know lots of uh, video documentaries as well as readings uh, that I give my students that I could uh, share with the rest of the Ventura College fine, community. Uh, and just to add to it, I just think there's a lot of, and I'll just speak for myself, uh, but my family of, I mean, of my first interaction, if you're a visual learner, is West Side Story. So I mean, you know how silly to be growing up with that kind of image. Um, obviously I've been through education, but I wanna be able to visually share his, historical, especially if they're not getting, and I am, I am glad that I think the K-12s are making ethnic studies a graduation requirement, but uh, it's just, there's a whole generation of parents that have no clue how to, how to get the word out. You know, I, I would, I mean, the, I speak with my, my my children, my kids, those of you that know me on campus know that I always have my two older children with me. And, um, you know, I constantly talking to their teachers about the curriculum. You know, what, what, what are you talking about when you talk about Spanish colonization? Uh, what are you talking about when uh, you're addressing um, the missions, right? Um, what are you, I, I, I make sure that they, um, know that they have access to me as well. Um, but yeah, documentaries, for sure. My kids, I have them watch the same documentaries. They're in fourth and fifth grade. Well, sixth grade now, fourth and sixth grade. And um, they watch the same material I give my students in my courses. Uh, they're never too young to be exposed to, to those images. Today's earlier presentation with Dr. Kendi, he said that exact same thing. There was a question. Was 10 years old too late to begin talking about racism? Is that too early? And his response is, that's way too late. Like, you should start at six months old when they're starting to babble. So it's like, that's way to go, Rubicella. Uh, I, I would like to share something with you. And this is in regards to the... Um, Spanish education for kids. A few years ago, I went to the Mexican embassy and they have a program where you can request books from the Mexico. Actually, this is one of the books that I get from them. And these you can teach your kids and they are for free. So you can go and use and request say, I had three or four kids or you can make a group and say, we need uh, 10 sets of uh, books for education and they're in Spanish. So, but you have to go on there and request it. Mm -hmm. And also speaking on the dual language, um, I, I myself have my kids inside the dual language program, uh, Ventura, Will Rogers. I know that uh, Gigi who's here and Jenna also have their kids there as well. And it's, it's unfortunate that it's not in every school. It should be. I mean, they're always exploring about culture and being exposed. The Spanish language does help introduce that. I mean, they, they, they do a Dia de los Muertos celebration and no other school does that. Um, so there's a lot of uh, culture that's involved with it, with the language, um, and makes that connection. Thank right. you, Francisco. Thanks, you.
Thank you. Uh, so now it is our, the time to end this uh, event for today, but we will continue to have these, these type of conversations, not only throughout this month, but throughout life, how anytime we need to educate ourselves once again, we know that we have resources out there that we can count on. And I would like to say thank you to the presenters, the speakers, Professor De Clark and Professor Camboa. Well, like I said, I learned a lot from both of your uh, presentations and I hope that we will be able to get your presentations so we can share them not only to the people, to the students and uh, faculty and staff came to the presentation, but to any students who would like to learn more about this topic at hand. So I would like to say thank you to the speakers and thank you for everyone for showing today. And we would like to like, we would also like to invite you next week to our event. Uh, same time, same day, same belief, same link as well. Thank you. Can, can I just make one last plug for Mecha? If you're interested in learning more about our culture, our Mecha Club meets every Tuesday, 1 o'clock via Zoom. It's on the VC website, and it will also be on social media. And Rubicela Gamboa is our student club advisor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank and you. Libby, do we send our presentations to you? Yes, you, you can send me your presentations. If you don't mind, I can share them with the audience or also put them on um, the website. I have a, a space on the website for our Latinx Heritage Month events. Um, so I will be uploading the recordings um, onto the ASVC events page. And I can also upload um, your PowerPoint, PowerPoint presentations um, if you are OK with that. So yes, please send um, I have a question. Um, the information that's provided in the chat when it's recorded, does that also, is that included or? So that does save. Um, and the, the chats that are sent to the whole entire group do get saved. Um, and I can send those to you as well and okay. upload those. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And I'll also be um, having the video or the re recordings um, close added closed captioning. So um, that's why it will take about a week for that. Okay. All right. Thanks, everybody. Have a great afternoon. You too. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Wonderful information. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.